Hi! So in this particular presentation, I'm going to talk about something that I find very interesting. And I've titled this video, Think Like an Entrepreneur, How Storytelling Can Unlock an Employee's Potential. Okay. So what I have done in this particular presentation is I have taken some of the ideas of Mary Parker Follett and integration, and then I've blended them with my own research interests in entrepreneurial storytelling. The potential audience of this video would be small business owners, entrepreneurs, and managers wishing to launch kind of corporate entrepreneurship initiatives, or quite frankly, executives in any organization that are dealing with kind of a stale bureaucracy. If you have any questions or comments on these videos or would like to see similar materials, I'm happy to talk more about uh, entrepreneurial narratives in another video or more about Mary Parker Follett's um, theories uh, and some additional follow-up videos if you like. If you are super interested in Mary Parker Follett, you can also check in my YouTube channel. I've got about six hours of Mary Parker Follett. I go through dynamic administration line by line, so we've got all the theory in there. If you'd like to know more about entrepreneurial opportunities or entrepreneurship, I've got a couple of playlists on my channel that you can look at as well. Of course, if you have any questions or specific videos that you'd like me to make on either of these subjects, post it in the comments. I will respond in 24 hours and a video will follow shortly. And I am a starving YouTube creator, so if you can give me a thumbs up, that's awesome. If you can subscribe, that's even better. I, I definitely appreciate the support from the YouTube community. So let me talk about one of the biggest problems that faces, I wish I could say it only faces organizations, but it also deals with interpersonal relations. And that is spin it around like I'm playing Candyland. And that is conflict. We all face conflict at least once a day. At least most of us do. And generally, conflict is seen as something like warfare or uh, a challenge or kind of a struggle. And there are two main approaches that we see in dealing with conflict. The first is coercion. Now, coercion means that you have one or more individuals or groups, and you have one person or group that has more power over other groups and they use that power to compel, to pressure, to force, or to bully the other groups into doing something that they don't really want to do. Now this power can come from a variety of sources. You know, the easiest example it could be physical power, strength. I can, you know, force someone to do something and if they don't do it, I'll beat them up. That's one way of looking at it, right? It can also be economic power, right? Um, you know, I have authority over this person because I'm giving them a paycheck and therefore they better do what I'm going to say otherwise I take away their economic livelihood. Or perhaps in civil service organizations it can come from superior position in a hierarchy. Either way, the problem with coercion is that you have clear winners and losers. The person who has more power is the winner, the person who has less power is the loser. And this is what Freud talks about is desire suppression for the loser because they have unrealized desires. They don't get to do what they want to do, so you have resentment and anger that builds up, and this can manifest itself in a very in a wide variety of detrimental ways in any organization. Okay. Examples of coercion. Facing peer pressure. I was in the military in my previous life, and that was definitely an organization that used coercion. You will do this, you will do that, or there will be punishment, and you will not like that punishment. And in fact, you find coercion in a wide variety of organizations that have high power distance. If you'd like to know more about high power distance, check my channel. I've got some videos on that. Another approach that's frequently advocated to resolve conflict is compromise. Okay? Compromise basically means that you have certain parties, certain groups of individuals, and in order to achieve some sort of a solution or some sort of a way forward, all individuals give up something that's important to them in exchange for getting something that is more important to them. Now, great examples of compromise. Think of contract negotiations. Okay? 
I want this, you want this. Well, how about I give up something I care a little bit less about in order to get something that's important. Let's at least get together and move on. Relationships are compromised, right? We don't always get everything we want and we've got to give up something in order to make our partner happy. Compromise is useful in situations where people maybe don't get along or it's something that is a very important subject to both parties and you need to take the heat out of the discussion. That's when compromise is useful. Okay? The problem with compromise is the same as coercion. Except with coercion you have winners and losers. In compromise everybody's a loser. I mean, let's face it, all parties have had to give up something that's important to them, and so therefore, there's again going to be that same desire suppression, and people are going to be a little bit unhappy. Okay. Now, one of the things to also consider are some examples of, of compromise. Think about a contract negotiation. Well, when you're negotiating back and forth on your contract, even if you do a good job of negotiating the contract, you still got to go back to your boss. And say, I know we, we wanted these certain things. I had to give that up in order to get something that was important to us. We had to get something to move on. It's not perfect, but at least it's a solution. Now, the one that I'm going to talk about in this particular video is integration. And integration thrives on an alternative understanding of conflict. So instead of looking at conflict as warfare, where there are clear winners and losers, integration looks at conflict as something that is not like warfare, something that does not have any sort of underlying ethical assumption, and it is, more importantly, something that is useful. It is nothing more than difference. And I like to challenge you to think maybe in terms of difference, but maybe friction. Now the image that I like to use for friction is that of a car trying to move against the ground. Now we know the ground wants to not move and we know the car wheel wants to turn and that friction is what enables a car to move forward. So integration thrives on this understanding of conflict and it tries to find a way to see differences as useful, right? Not warfare, not disagreement, not anger, but useful differences and usefulness in diversity. Okay, this comes from Mary Parker Follett. Integration basically means then that you get to the heart of what multiple parties actually want, right? Typically, we all agree on the big things within an organization. Most people agree on like the mission, they agree on the values, they agree on a broad sense. It's the little weeds and the details that we find disagreement. Integration implies a third way, not coercion, not compromise, a third way where you go back up to the mission and values and see if you and all the involved parties can find some sort of a way to reinterpret the mission and values in a way that you can all agree on. Now the good thing about integration is the fact that everybody comes out a winner, right? The bad thing about integration is it's not always possible. Integration is not possible, for example, if two men want to marry the same woman. There'll be no integration. If two sons wish to inherit the same family home, there will be no integration. Okay. Let me give a couple of examples of integration in action that might, uh, might be helpful. I consulted once for uh, a firm that had one of these kind of elite managerial training programs, you know, so the, the kids graduated from university and they did like this really intensive two-year management training thing and they became kind of like regional managers uh, of this uh, company's organization. And one of the benefits of being one of these managerial trainees is they got free use of a company car as long as they were doing company business. Now you think what really happened, right? You got a bunch of young people, 22, 23, 24, they're broke, maybe they don't have their own car, or maybe they're having to borrow a car, maybe they're using an Uber. And so what happens is they use the company car to maybe pick up some groceries, and of course they were using company gas cards and stuff. And you know, it wound up you know, getting that you had a real conflict. The resource manager spent all of his time auditing young employees, trying to figure out if they were you know, stealing company gasoline, stealing company car time. The, the employees started feeling, you know, resentment and guilt every time they'd break the rules a little bit. And the CEO was called in to try to resolve the problem. 
my suggestion was actually a classic Mary Parker fault integration type. In other words, I asked the president, I said, you know what? Let's think about what everybody wants. The young employees would like to have free use of the car. The resource manager is tired of auditing all of the stuff for the car. And you, the CEO, want happy employees. Well, what if you just said, here's the company car, you can use it for personal use too, and the gas too. And it's just a benefit. And now you're going to attract happier employees, and maybe you're going to keep them longer. And he went with that. And it saved, because the employees were happier, the boss came off looking like a real hero, and of course, the resource manager got to focus on things like logistics, and that actually mattered to the company's bottom line. Because let's face it, people are using the gas card or using the company card a little bit, it's not going to break a large company like that's back. Um, especially when you compare it to the cost of turnover. I'll give another example of integration, and it'll tie into the next block. Think of Tom Sawyer. We all know this story where Tom got in trouble with Aunt Polly, and she said, you know what, Tom, you've been bad. You're going to go out there and you're going to paint the fence. Well, Tom didn't really want to paint the fence, but he wanted to make Aunt Polly happy. So what he did is he composed a narrative and he explained to all the other little boys in the neighborhood, hey, I got this really good opportunity for you. You can paint a fence. I don't want to paint a fence to the other little boys. He said, yeah, but this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You can do something you can't do every day and you get the satisfaction of seeing a painted fence. And somehow the little boys kind of liked that because it wasn't whether they wanted to paint the fence or not, but it was the fact that they wanted to do something new and unique and fun. And Tom made it fun, right? And so integration occurred because Aunt Polly wanted the fence painted, Tom wanted Aunt Polly happy, and the little boys wanted to do something fun. So through telling a story, he was able to achieve integration and get that fence painted. And by the way, through his story, Tom was able to materially benefit. That ties us into storytelling. So storytelling is the specific application of the theory of integration. Now, when I mean what I what I mean by stories, you know, we all have parents, bosses, whatever, and maybe they tell anecdotes to illustrate a point. I'm not exactly talking about that. And I'm not talking about those lame case studies that you have to read in your undergraduate business classes and your MBA programs. Not talking about that as stories. But instead, I'm talking about stories as a character-driven narrative where the characters in the story have some sort of a problem or opportunity that they have to overcome. And these problems or opportunities are communicated in that story in such a way that individuals hearing, reading, or seeing that story in action can relate to that story, interact with that story, see themselves in that story, and apply the findings of that story for their own ways and their own reasons. And there's some pretty decent science behind storytelling. First of all, there's the physical application of storytelling. Now I'm going to tell you whether it's talking about bachelor students or executives, MBAs and PhDs, everybody has the attention span of a flea. And if you hadn't watched this video for a full 13 minutes, I'd know that you're one of those people that, with the attention span of a flea. So thank you for continuing to watch. Anyhow. When you tell a story, as a storyteller, very few people tell stories with their mouths or even with simple slides. A good storyteller tells the story with their body. They tell it with their emotions. Uh, not the words, but with their voice. And sometimes they even have physical objects, like a prototype, to tell that story. And when they start telling that story, guess what happens? People stop taking out their phone and looking at it. They stop chatting with their neighbor. They put their pens and pencils down and they listen. Okay. Now, kind of my expert tip is because of this physical aspect of storytelling, when I do my slides, I just put pictures on my slides. I very rarely even have very many words because I want people to focus on me, the storyteller. People zone out when they see slides. Okay, so there's the physical aspect. And once you get them to put down the pens, the pencils, and listen to you, that's when we get, bam, the, the mental component of the story. Right? People start to listen, they start to focus on you, and it's almost like you engage in one of those Vulcan mind melds, right? And so what happens when you're engaging in this kind of Vulcan mind meld, people start to see themselves in your story. They start to sense the things that you're talking about, and they start to ask themselves, hmm, I wonder how I would react in a similar situation. You leave it kind of open-ended. Now, there's also an emotional component to storytelling. And this is where it gets real funky because storytelling 
engages the left and the right sides of the brain simultaneously. And I was reading some papers that were saying that when someone is totally enraptured in a story, it releases cortisol into the, the bloodstream. And that cortisol helps people focus on minute details. And it also releases Oxycontin to the bloodstream to help people think more creatively. So it's engaging the left and the right sides of the brain simultaneously. So there is a tremendous amount of power behind storytelling. And again, stone spinning around. Which way am I going to go next? I'm leaving you guessing, right? See, I even, I, you know, so when you see, I'm looking at a picture of the screen so I can kind of see how I'm, I'm, I'm taping. So as I try to move one way, I realize the board's on the other side. That's why you're going to see me spinning around so much. Anyhow, with storytelling, you engage in what my friend Kevin Hendel calls the plus zone challenge, or what Whitehead would talk about is the struggle against inert organizations, or excuse me, inert learning, or what Karl Marx would say is the ability to move from simply interpreting history, but also now changing it. It is a way that you are bridging theory and practice. Okay? And when you engage theory and practice, you engage the total person. Okay? And what that means by engaging the total person, if you remember no other way to say this, I always said this when I was in the army, if your soldiers fear you, they will fight for you. But if they love you, they will die for you. Now, hopefully in our regular corporations, we're not asking people to die for us, right? But think about this. If people see their role in the organization is important and, and they are kind of engaging that integration and they're kind of defining their role and, and, and helping to support that organization's opportunity for their own ways and their own reasons, this is how you get teamwork. This is how you get synergy. This is how you get people to come in on the weekends because they believe that the mission of the organization is important to them and they understand how they fit into there. And furthermore, this is how we start shifting from being a manager to being a leader. You shift away from managing problems and you start moving into a leader or also an entrepreneur who helps people seize and exploit their opportunities. The manager is no longer a manager, but maybe a colleague or a senior coach. The storyteller who helps people find how they can integrate into what is going on in that organization. That's the cool part. Okay? And that's what I mean by there's no delegation because leaders at that point don't even have power. All right? It's the situation that is the leader themselves. So delegation is inappropriate because they don't have the authority or power in the first place. All they have done is highlight that situation so that people can adhere to the needs of the particular opportunity. And that's what I mean by thinking like an, oper uh, thinking like an entrepreneur. This is how you revitalize the organization. You generate that buy-in through the use of an effective story. Bam! Okay. Let me give an example. Um, I'm, a child, I'm a child of the 80s, and so I'll tell a little bit of a metaphor about storytelling. I don't know if you all know He-Man. I think He-Man is epic, and I've been geeking out recently. They have a, a, I bought this thing at Barnes & Noble. It was like this collection of the He-Man mini-comics, so I'm kind of on a He-Man binge uh, right now for the first time in about 30 years. Oh, my. So, anyhow, I'm digressing just a little bit, but... He-Man is a perfect metaphor for how storytelling works, okay? When you think about all the little boys, you know, they all go play He-Man at someone else's house. There's usually one little boy, and he's the one with the, the Castle Grayskull playset, which is kind of like one of the master playsets, or the Snake Mountain playset, or the Fright Zone playset, whatever. It's usually the kid that has the really expensive toy. It's the, the parents that had the $20, and they went to $20 in the 80s, by the way, very different than... $20 right now, but you know they had the $20 to buy the Castle Grayskull or, or whatever, so they, they, they kid usually had some better toys or maybe a better setup. And all the other little boys would bring their own action figures, their own Masters of the Universe um, to the other, the other kid's house. Now the kid who had the Castle Grayskull or the Master playset would define an opportunity. Hey guys, we have an opportunity to take Castle Grayskull, or hey, we have an opportunity to defend Castle Grayskull, or hey, here's, a, here's an opportunity to take Snake Mountain where Skeletor's gone. 
And all the little boys would have their own little action figures, and each action figure has different personalities, different you know superpowers and things like that. And the action figures, the little boys controlling them, would work together such that the sum, it, the whole, is greater than the sum of the individual parts. So solutions can be achieved that are much better, much stronger, much more significant than something that would simply be done with one action figure or even a bunch of action figures working individually. So it generates this kind of synergy. Now again, I'm not going to use the cliche that you know you can make work as, as natural as play. You know That's really not what I'm going to talk about here. But I think the He-Man metaphor is very powerful uh, for illustrating how managers or leaders or leaders who think like entrepreneurs rather Instead of just managing employees, they put the opportunity up front and allow kind of a natural synergy to arise and allow people to um, interpret the problem or contribute to the circumstances, contribute to the solution their own ways and their own reasons. And I actually borrow this from uh, a lot of postmodernists where people see that a text has a mutually uh, reflexive interaction. So can a spoken uh, story or even one reified and things like material objects. All right, I hope you enjoy this video. Again, I'm I'm begging you. If you liked it, give me a thumbs up. Uh, give me a subscribe. If you have any questions, post them in the comments down below. And like I said, I will get to uh, I will get to you in 24 hours. And again, thanks for watching. And again, don't hesitate also uh, to look down on the the link below with uh, the link to my channel. I've got. You know, tons of videos available on many, many subjects. And if there's something else you'd like me to talk about, let me know and I'll whip something up for you. Thank you.